Chapter 4 Life Goes On If you came this way, taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity, or carry report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid, and prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind, or the sound of the voice praying. T.S. Eliot. There is a time for outreach and discovery, and there is a time for sanctuary. For a while, it seemed as though I had achieved both through the same process. The public debut for The Lamb and the Lion was on Palm Sunday, immediately after its completion. Again, the order of events was perfect. Just as Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, so did this painting enter its ministry on that day. It was shown again on Easter and virtually every Sunday thereafter. So meaningful and graceful were the course of events that I did not look for sanctuary in any other way. By the fall of 1993, however, I was road weary and eager for a bit of rest and relaxation. The last 18 months had been a whirlwind of activity, travel, challenge, and personal growth. Moreover, when we were not on the road, we were usually receiving visitors from far and wide in our living room. We especially enjoyed the children who came to our home. Their candid and innocent recognitions of the master were always delightful and often profoundly inspirational. In return, they got to stroke Gunner or at least catch glimpses of the cat who saw Christ. So enthralled were we in the process of sharing that we forgot about our own needs. As I realized the extent of my exhaustion, I sought communion with the master about it. In my reverie, I was flooded with nostalgia for the peaceful harmonies I had formerly experienced in the studio. I had painted only once since The Lamb and the Lion, and nine months had passed since that one exception. Willingly, I had chosen two years previously to retire my brushes as I sought a higher pathway, and I could have lived with that decision if the hand of destiny had not intervened. Ironically, as that destiny unfolded, the brush was brought back into my hand. Now, two years later, I was not using those abilities, and that was the cause of my nostalgia. The duties I felt toward the lamb and the lion held an importance which cast a shadow on everything else, and besides, what other subject could provide me with such passion and peace? In short, it was a tough act to follow. Until the fall of 1992, my love of painting had been dismissed as an aspect of personal history. I was frequently asked to create other paintings of Jesus the most popular request being to paint him with his mother in her traditional Madonna pose. With as much diplomacy as I could summon, I tactfully declined all persuasions, reminding everyone who inquired that any subsequent portrayals of him would have to be as specially ordained as the first one. If he wanted another painting enough to arrange for its creation, then it would be my pleasure and privilege to consent. Aside from special circumstances, however, the common rhetoric of religious art still held little attraction for my creative heart. With such considerations in place, I really believed that further portrayals were unlikely, and that was true for more than six months. In the fall of 1992, much to my surprise, those special circumstances were arranged and another vision was brought to me. It happened in a little country church where I had given the evening presentation. During the closing prayer, 
I noticed the rare fragrance I always sensed when Jesus was in my studio. Lifting my head and opening my eyes brought confirmation of what I suspected. He was there. Without a word to startle the others, I quietly beheld a fascinating process. With every passing second, he regressed in age until he became an infant in his mother's arms. Mary was young and classically Hebrew in appearance. In her loveliness, she was the image of innocence and barely more than a child herself. After a few minutes, the vision stabilized and remained unchanged for the two months required to paint it. The flame of love, as the painting came to be called, was completed on the 12th day of the 12th month at 12 noon, exactly nine months from the day the lamb and the lion saw its completion. The final touches were barely made in time for a formal reception in its honor that afternoon. More than 200 people attended, eyes filled with tears, and mouths fell agape at the youthful authenticity of Mary. Others were stunned at the undeniable resemblance of the child to his manly fulfillment in the lamb and the lion. From that moment on, our life became a flurry of activity, and my brushes gathered dust. I virtually forgot that painting was still in my heart until September 1993. Finally, on that bright autumn morning, I wanted to create art again. What's more, I wanted to do it in a home that did not belong to the rest of the world. As I recognized my personal yearnings, I recalled the serenity of being in his presence. It was so different from the hectic pace Brian and I had been maintaining. Looking across the living room, I focused upon his countenance in the painting, hoping to join him in that place of special peace. Just then, a very interesting thing happened. Instead of seeing his face, I saw hundreds of other faces, people who had been blessed by the painting. One by one, layers of faces peeled away until I saw only his. That communication had special significance for me. It was about simplicity, reverence, and sanctity. I knew that a turning point had arrived in the life of the painting, just as I wanted the solitude and sanctuary of my studio again I was being told that the painting required sanctuary as well. It needed to be in a reverent and quiet place where the hearts, lives, and beliefs of everyone approaching it could be equally respected. One of the first decisions I ever made about the painting was that its life and service should be ecumenical, belonging to no denomination and preferably to no religious doctrine whatsoever. Perhaps the most distinguishing characteristics of the lamb and the lion, in contrast to thousands of other portrayals of him, is the uniquely personal and gracious welcome it extends to everyone. I wanted to keep it that way. My hesitation in regard to housing the painting in a church stemmed from those considerations as well as the fact that most churches are open to the public for only a few hours, one day a week. These things were both a reality and a concern to me. I did not have the answers, although I was certain he did. Through prayer and meditation, I released my anxieties to a higher guidance. Sometimes, however, release is more easily desired than attained. For several weeks, no logical solutions were presented and worries mounted. I didn't have a clue where to look. Tense days led to restless nights as we continued our outreach and kept up our normal routine. I should have expected a miracle, but as usual, I let it catch me by surprise. For the second time in my life, I was about to be awakened by a holy light in my home. 
This time, it happened at three o'clock in the morning. Startled from my sleep, I looked for rational explanations, but there were none. It became evident that the light was supernatural, just as the first one had been. So, I propped up my pillows and waited. Within minutes, the light had become focused in the corner of the room, taking the form of an angel. That was a startling phenomenon. As a child, I had believed in angels, although I never thought about them except at Christmas, and certainly I never expected to see one during my years on earth. What was before me was a rare perception, for I am not a psychic visionary or gifted with extra perceptual abilities. Until recently, my perceptions had never exceeded the normal fabric of human experience. Therefore, as an artist, I was also not inclined toward the subject of angels. My lifetime of involvement with the visual arts had assisted me in developing a strong and vivid imagination capable of recalling or redesigning whatever I have seen. However, if anyone had asked me to paint an angel, I probably would have responded in the manner of Courbet, the French realist, who said more than a century earlier, if you show me an angel, I'll paint an angel. Altogether, my lack of expectancy left me unprepared for what was before me. I sat up bewildered and stunned as the angel said, be not afraid. I have come to let you know that your prayers have been heard. Arrangements are being made for the painting's home. I was delighted with what he said, but I was even more fascinated with how he said it. The sound that my ears heard was lovely celestial music, while at the same time the sound that my mind heard was the spoken English language. It left me with the distinct impression that the music he spoke was a universal language which would have translated into whatever word-based language anyone hearing it might be accustomed to using. In days to come, as I reflected back upon this event, it occurred to me that even the visual apparition might have been a translation of realities from a universal presence to a form more suitable to being perceived. His stay felt like 20 minutes, but it was probably shorter than that. No less than the angels of legend, he was the bearer of good news as well as the bringer of answers. Despite my repeated requests, however, he would give me no specific details on heaven's plan for the paintings. Before leaving, he placed his hand on my heart and said, I leave you with this seed of consciousness from which you will be given further insights and instructions. I waited passively under the supposition that any instructions or answers I needed would come forth spontaneously. After a week or so, however, curiosity overtook my patience. Waiting has never been my favorite pose and certainly not with matters of destiny. I thought of a thousand prayers, but quietly surrendered to silent meditation, hoping to fall into that special place in my heart where the angel had left the seed of consciousness. I dwelt in peace for the longest time, then looked, knocked, and prodded. Nothing came. Just as I was about to leave that contemplative state, I heard the music again. I focused in as I had done before, and the words were made manifest. What? I shook my head in disbelief. The one thing he said made no sense in relation to my concerns. He told me to build a prayer screen. What was a prayer screen? And why did I need to build one? I had sought an answer and received a work order. For the rest of the day, I searched for justifications, but none of them made any real sense. 
The only rational conclusion I could draw was that a prayer screen might foster a place of greater reverence in which to pray and meditate more effectively. Nevertheless, who am I to argue with an angel? Off I went to our local home improvement warehouse to search for ideas of what to build and how to do it. I spent considerable time there walking the aisles, looking for sparks of inspiration and clues of how to proceed. After the many months of renovating our house, I knew my way around rather well and was on a first name basis with most of the salesmen. In spite of that, my search there seemed to be in vain. All of the materials were rough and heavy and required power tools. On my way out, I passed through the display of doors when suddenly I tripped on a solid object and almost tumbled to the floor. Someone had left a door lying flat in the aisle. I reached down to pick it up, expecting it to be heavy. Much to my surprise, it was very lightweight. It was a hollow ash door, and as I held it, I noticed how lovely the wood grains were. Moreover, it was only 24 inches across, a suitable width for what I needed. Within minutes, I was integrating the possibilities. I could hinge three of these panels together and have a lovely screen, a bit of decoration, some varnish, and then it could be a prayer screen, whatever that might be. The motif of synchronicity and purposeful coincidence was only just beginning. The doors needed to be shortened, but I had learned how to do that from the men who had renovated our home. Once the panels were ready to be assembled, I took them into my studio. Looking them over carefully, I noticed that the grains on one side were beautiful and suitable for varnish as they were. However, all three doors were plain on the other side. Clearly, they needed some enhancement. But what? Before I knew it, I was standing before one of the ash panels with brush in hand, spontaneously painting an angel. It seemed to be an appropriate reflection of responsibility back to the one who had ordered the screen. Little did I know that the door in front of me was more than a painting. It would become a threshold for my own greater unfolding. By 1993, angels had become a popular subject for artists and decorators. However, I did not see myself as part of that domain, which seemed rightly to belong to artists with visionary perceptions of the angelic realm, or else to those with antiquarian love for classical and Victorian concepts. My realist style and one-time angelic visitation hardly qualified me for either. On that day in the studio, the only intent or purpose of which I was aware was that of decorating a prayer screen and completing a work order. For my reward, I hoped to find an answer on the finished side of that project. The answer took its time in arriving, but the reward which accompanied it was greater than anything I expected. From the beginning, there was a noticeable upsurge of energy and personal joy as I painted the angels on those doors, and the completed screen was much more beautiful than I envisioned. It was finished just in time to be shown at our annual Christmas party, although it was not for sale. It had been nine months that I, since I had presented any new work, so that fact alone made it the talk of the party. There was also something refreshing and candid about the response it elicited. One woman, in particular, fell in love with it and persistently tried to buy it. Uninterested in her proposition, I explained the best I could that the screen had a special inspirational value to me and that it was not for sale. Disregarding my no, she telephoned daily until I finally consented to her wishes. Her persuading argument was that I could make another one for myself. With that plan in mind, 
I agreed that she could have it. As soon as she arrived home with her angel screen, she noticed that it was too large to fit comfortably with the floor plan of her house. Unthwarted by small issues, however, she took an imaginative look at another possibility and then telephoned me to gain support for her idea. She wanted to dismantle the screen and hang the separate panels on her wall. In the final analysis, she loved the angels more than the screen. As a result of her influence, new perceptions and possibilities would open for me as well. Meanwhile, other synchronicities were accumulating around her which could hardly be regarded as accidental. Two days later, she telephoned again, asking me if I would be willing to replace the angel panels she had purchased. Why? I asked. Have they been stolen or damaged? With a bit of timidness, she admitted that she had sold them and proceeded to explain why. A prayer group to which she belonged had met in her home the night before, and two members of the group wanted to purchase the panels for their church. With a persistence reminiscent of her own, they apparently had refused to take no for an answer. This project was beginning to reveal a noticeable pattern of will far greater than my own, like wind blowing through the trees. I was curious to know what was blowing in, so I quickly assembled the materials and began to create replacement panels. Although it began as a duty, before I knew what was happening, I was immersed in a delightful process of discovery with the rarest expressions and freedoms I had ever felt. By instinct or anticipation, I must have known this might occur because I had already made a crucial decision. I had selected wider doors and had reduced the height considerably so that the proportion would be more suitable for paintings with design, expression, and development. As I brought them to fruition, I found depth of intuition, creative confidence, and instinctive beauty that would have been blocked in the past by my classical work habits and expectations of effort. Moreover, it all happened very quickly. In less than two weeks, I had her paintings ready for delivery. No sooner had she hung them on her wall than she called me again. Glenda, could you paint one more panel for me? I sold another one. The wind through my trees was moving up to gale force. This was just the beginning of a phenomenon. For almost two years from that moment, I painted angels on doors, and always within days of completion, someone arrived at my studio to behold and declare, that's my angel. What never ceases to amaze me is the perfect synchronicity in the angel's choice of ash doors for a medium. In addition to being a door, it provided a doorway for expanding my awareness and a metaphorical expression of the angelic presence in the universe. After all, do they not stand as guardians of the doorway to higher consciousness? One thing is certain, as a classically trained artist, I never would have selected such a medium without external intervention. Most certainly, I would not have accepted it as a catalyst for stylistic evolution. That's getting ahead of the story, however. The cornerstone and pivotal reason behind the unfolding events was about to be revealed in February of 1994. My client's friends from the church, which had purchased the first two panels, wanted more angels and wanted to meet with me personally. We met in our home where they saw the lamb and the lion for the first time. It was a warm and moving experience for us all and the beginning of a deep and meaningful friendship. In addition, they commissioned me to paint seven archangels for their chapel. That project consumed most of the approaching spring and gave us a chance to become better acquainted. This was a Christian organization 
which was more than simply a church. At the time of its founding in 1939, this non-denominational fellowship declared that it would remain open to all people and open to all aspects of Christian truth, hence its name, Christ Truth League. Since that time, it has taught me and served quietly on its beautiful 14 acres in Fort Worth. In keeping with the ecumenical ideal, its outreach has largely been through publishing and through generous support of other Christian fellowships. The chapel, which is a charming mix of traditional and modern motifs, is situated in the midst of an exquisitely landscaped garden. Altogether, this lovely environment has a serenity and spirit of sanctuary which can refresh the weariest soul. It certainly has that effect on me. Dr. Applegate, the minister, was deeply inspired by the lamb and the lion and asked me if I would display it in the chapel and provide a Sunday service. As it turned out, the day we chose was also the first day of the new angel's painting that would be placed on the walls. When that day arrived, it was a dazzling spring morning without a cloud in the sky. I was happy about the good weather, although it did not seem to matter as far as the painting was concerned. Regardless of inclement weather preceding or following a presentation, at the time of our arrival, conditions would always be clear and fine. More than once, rain would be pouring through gusts of wind until the moment we needed to expose the painting to the elements. Then, a spontaneous clearing would occur. These were common and predictable miracles which I had come to take for granted. Nevertheless, I was glad that the birds were singing and the sun was shining on that Sunday. It was just one more thing I would not have to worry about, or so I thought. Just as the benediction was being said, the sky darkened and the elements clapped a loud amen with thunder and lightning. In just moments, rain was pouring in sheets. In every other instance where weather had presented some obstacles, a little patience always provided safe passage, but it would not happen on that day, nor for three days. Day and night, it rained continuously. The only thing that was clear was the fact that the painting had to remain. For the first time in the life of the painting, it would be transferred to someone else's care. The painting was not insured outside of our custody, not that I had any real worries. Therefore, the church accepted its new responsibility with a bit of insecurity as well as reverence. To that end, the members and ministry of the church brought sleeping bags and maintained a 72-hour vigil around the painting which proved to be as much for their benefit as for the painting. Many dreams and visions were brought to consciousness as well as soul-deep bondings with the love and natural grace of the master's portrayal. The most important dream was brought to Debbie, the church member who had purchased the first angels. She was told that the lamb and the lion was home. Had this dream not been divinely inspired, that would have been an audacious presumption. For never had I mentioned to anyone except Brian that any home other than our own was being considered. It was actually several weeks before she worked up the courage to mention her dream, and even then, only when I first remarked that our visit to the church with the painting was the highlight of our spring. Her message caught me by surprise, as did the whole proposition. Having had no knowledge of Christ's Truth League prior to February, I had once more been brought to face the unexpected. However, as I surveyed the possibility, it became obvious that housing in their chapel met every criterion I had wanted, 
including the fact that it was open seven days a week to all people for prayer and meditation. It was easy to find, reverent, and beautiful. Arrangements were finalized, and by June, the lamb and the lion and the flame of love were happily situated in their new home. It was a wonderful conclusion to a long journey. Every part of the journey had been facilitated by miracles, but only then, as I beheld the two paintings hanging contentedly with their escort of angels, did I begin to realize how important the patterns of synchronicity had been as they moved through my life and brought the will of God into clear view. Synchronicity must surely be the dynamic process of miracles unfolding, if only we would listen and respond. Every day the paintings continue to receive new visitors, often from around the world. People of every age, creed, and color come to behold, pray, meditate, or quietly receive the blessings of the Master through his portrayal. What the symbolic contents of the paintings mean, I cannot say, since they were neither the invention nor the choice of my own consciousness. For many people, the elements of the painting have become catalysts for personal messages. I am equally limited to explain or justify the way he chose to be presented. The vision was by his initiation and arrangement. However, I would like to think that he looked that way when he walked upon the earth 2,000 years ago. Many people who have had near-death experiences have written or called me to confirm this hope by sharing their experiences of him from a higher plane. One minister, whose friendship I now cherish, offered the following passage from one of her seminary books as an additional support for the hope that these portrayals may be realistically authentic. This is a description of Jesus by Publius Lentulus, governor of Judea, addressed to Tiberius Caesar, emperor of Rome. It was found in an excavated city written in Aramaic on stone. There lives at this time in Judea a man of singular virtue whose name is Jesus Christ, whom the barbarians esteem as a prophet, but his followers love and adore him as the offspring of the immortal God. He calls back the dead from the graves and heals all sorts of diseases with a word or a touch. He is a tall man and well-shaped, of an amiable and reverent aspect. His hair of a color that can hardly be matched, the color of chestnut full ripe, falling in waves about his shoulders. His forehead high, large, and imposing his cheeks without spot or wrinkle, beautiful with a lovely red, his nose and mouth formed with exquisite symmetry, his beard thick and of a color suitable to his hair reaching below his chin, his eyes bright blue, clear and serene, look innocent, dignified, manly, and mature, in proportion of body, most perfect and captivating, his hands and arms most delectable to behold. He rebukes with majesty, counsels with mildness, his whole address, whether in word or deed, being eloquent and grave. No man has seen him laugh yet his manner is exceedingly pleasant. But he has wept in the presence of men. He is temperate, modest, and wise. A man, for his extraordinary beauty and divine perfections, surpassing the children of men in every sense. 
The most remarkable aspect about that passage is that it was written about a Jew by a Roman, about a man by a man, in a day and age when such tender and reverent compliments were most unlikely except under conditions of extreme respect. The paintings now had a life of their own. As for myself, I continued to paint angels on ash doors until early 1996. Perhaps that was the length of time needed for me to pass through my next doorway to greater understanding and personal unfoldment. I must add, however, that I did not see every angel I painted. I sensed their love in a powerful and moving way. Every now and then, I caught a glimpse of some passing light out of the corner of my eye or an unusual fragrance that appeared out of context. Nevertheless, my perceptual field was still grounded in the common dimension we call normal, whatever that means. I painted them because a hunger in my soul had been aroused to know and to behold the higher life. Even more than that, the act of surrender, which had been so painful in the beginning, was now becoming a submission to joy as I allowed the forces of higher consciousness to pour through me and bring to fruition the beauty of its presence. I no longer needed a sitter in front of me or a vision to behold. The vision now was the beseeching of my heart which desired nothing less than a chance to honor and serve a higher guidance, as well as the privilege of connecting with my fellow man, soul to soul. The threshold had been crossed, and a new world of creative expression welcomed me. As that realization was attained, I made the artistic transition from doors back to material more suitable to fine painting. The ash doors, as a tangible metaphor, were no longer needed because now my heart was the doorway. As my new work evolved, so did my own awareness. I continued to paint angels, and they were more beautiful than ever. Yet more importantly, an extra dimension was developing in the expression. This was a dimension which included and revealed the human soul. After more than 100 paintings of angels, one thing I noticed about them all was an unmistakable presence of the persons for whom they were painted. This does not mean there was a physical portrait, for that rarely happened. Nevertheless, there was a clear signatory presence which sometimes expressed itself through a choice of colors, symbols, or settings, or more likely through the nature of the communication itself. It would be far from the truth to say that I understand the nature of angels or their relationship with us, although I do know that it is not their duty or right to interfere with our lives. Apparently, as companions from other dimensions, they sometimes steer us from danger and seek always to elevate our understanding. This is done through a soul connection. That soul connection became more and more obvious to me. When I first began painting angels, my emphasis was upon the angel as a unique manifestation from the higher realms of existence. However, by 1995, a significant change of priorities had occurred. The higher part of the human soul, which touches the angels, became at least as important in my new paintings as the presentation of angelic motifs. No doubt this parallels and reflects the pattern of my own spiritual growth in those days. As life progressed, there was another significant change learning to proceed without the lamb and the lion as my constant companion and inspiration for both living and painting. At first, it was like having good friends move away, 
yet still feeling the ghost of their presence in all the familiar places. Then I spilled into a reverie of treasured memories, yet as time passed, I realized that nothing important had been lost. The master was still with me in spirit, and the richness of my personal growth was more than my hopes had envisioned. Each day while I painted, I would look for his presence, and usually I would find reminders of his influence. However, a peculiar change of emphasis was happening in my relationship with him, just as it had occurred with the angels. Our connection through the soul was becoming more important than any physical manifestation. I found myself remembering the original sacred visitation more vividly than the vision which came from it. On that special day, November 23rd, 1991, I had no idea who was standing before me in the white light of pure spiritual form. All I was certain of was His Holiness. In recent years, as I savored the memory and clung to it for guidance, I came to realize that it was Jesus as a pure and eternal soul. This greater understanding has had a profound effect on my own self-awareness. Now it has become a beacon for everything I seek to become. In honor of that memory and the growing awareness of its purity, I have created a painting of the original encounter which I call First Light. It represents for me the beginning and the ending of my search. For in the perfect peace of love, truth, and serenity is our ultimate sanctuary. This is the sacred heart, the kingdom of heaven, which dwells within. No longer do I seek my inspiration from the external. Daily, my sanctuary is being attained not as a passive retreat, but as a dynamic living process which guides my life and my work. At last I know that the Sacred Heart is humanity's church, the inner sanctum where the soul is forever in communion with God and in brotherhood with all life. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between the two waves of the sea. Quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. T.S. Eliot